Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. We're not using the uh, digital audio workstation uh, in this one, so just a desktop and tellingly, a rather large picture of a microphone. This video is about microphones, about basically what they are, because if you don't understand the basic mechanics, you don't need to get technical about them, but if you don't understand the basic mechanics, you can struggle. Um, and then looking at what you do need, and what's probably going to be the most practical solution for your needs. You're still gonna to need to work out the exact mic, but we can point you in the right kinds of directions on how to get it set up and how to get the right results. This is not an exact science. People try to treat it like it's an exact thing, like you ask, well, what's a good microphone? They tell you exactly the one that they've got, and that's it. Or they ask you some questions and then tell you the exact mic. Who knows? You have to find what works for you. But to find what works for you, you need to understand how it works. Also, how to work it. Because the same microphone can be used by different engineers, different singers, and get quite different results. Like, there are some people who hate a particular microphone because it never delivers what they want. And yet they'll like another microphone that most other people hate because it delivers what they want. This is the important thing. There is no exact... There are certain things because they're the laws of physics, but there are no exact. So the very first question, of course, is what is a microphone? Now, we all think we know the answer to that, but largely people are pretty loose once we get past that. So very simply, a microphone is what's called a transducer. It takes what it hears, the vibration that it picks up, and it transforms that to electricity. Now, for most of us, we already spend a lot of time with another kind of transducer, which is called a speaker. So it doesn't matter whether it's headphones or loudspeakers or your ooey boom or whatever. There's a speaker. Now, that's a transducer. It does exactly what a microphone does, only the other way around. We've all seen those pictures of speaker cones doing this. Woompa, 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 woompa. What's happening there is that they are being fed electricity, which is probably the signal of the music that goes down wires as electricity, surprisingly large amounts of electricity, actually, if you're getting loud, and there's a magnet in there, and that magnet then forces the speaker to move backwards and forwards, and that makes the cone move backwards and forwards, and the cone moving backwards and forwards makes the air in front of that cone move backwards and forwards, air travels to your ears, you hear banging tunes. A microphone is exactly the same, only it's the other way around. So we speak, we create noise in the general direction of a microphone, which moves the air, which then moves what's called the diaphragm inside the mic. And that gets pushed backwards and forwards. The pushing backwards and forwards is read by a magnet, which transforms that to electricity, which sends it up the wires to the studio stuff. They're exactly the same. It is 100% doable to use a loudspeaker as a microphone. I don't recommend that you do it in most instances, but it is fully doable. Understand that they work exactly the same. It's just one's designed to push sound out, the other designed to bring sound in and transform it to electricity, which transforms it into what we as mix engineers can do stuff with. There are broadly a couple of types of microphones. There are lots of types of microphones, but in practical terms for a singer or somebody looking to record a, a, a conventional instrument, there are two types, basically, of microphone. There is the dynamic microphone. This one tends to get a lot of negative press these days, and that is just darned stupid. The microphone that you're looking at on screen at the moment is the single most famous microphone in the history of microphones, and... It's a dynamic microphone, and just about any time you see anyone on stage, chances are you see five of them across the front of the stage. A dynamic microphone is designed to be very robust and very practical. It does not require a power input, which also makes it very practical. You don't need to run power inputs everywhere. It is also, as I mentioned before, prone to being able to be, not always, but it is capable of being physically a lot more robust. Therefore, the 
sure SM58 that you see there, which is why you would see Roger Daltrey from The Who swinging it around his head. Not a thing we would ever recommend, but they were built so tough you could swing them around your head, bash them against the stage, pick them up and keep singing. Don't treat your mics this way, but that's a big difference. They are technically a little less sensitive than the other type of the condenser, which is an earlier form of the mic, but they are inherently far more forgiving, especially if you are not experienced. And by experienced, I mean very experienced in using mics. Because you used a mic once does not make you experienced. Because you once made an MP3 out of a WAV file does not make you a qualified mix engineer. It's really important to understand this because otherwise you get ahead of yourself. You think you know way more than you do and then you don't take time to understand what you have got and how to make the most of it. So the dynamic mic is the first and most important kind of microphone for the average at home door using musician. They are capable of being incredibly high quality. There are plenty of records to this day which are still made using Shure SM58 microphones. So robust, incredibly practical, and they will do almost any job that you want them to do well. The condenser is more sensitive, but it's also an awful lot more delicate, and it requires phantom power. Phantom power is where you have to feed the microphone power, as in it needs to have an electricity supply to be able to do its thing. Phantom power can blow a mic if you feed it wrong. Because the condenser mics are pretty sensitive, they can be blown up by being fed phantom power. Also, if you don't feed them phantom power, <laughs> they simply won't work. Phantom power is a strange kind of a name, but it's a small amount of electricity. It's a very specific amount and type of electricity that is sent to that microphone. And it has to be right, or A, it doesn't work, B, it blows up. Condenser mics are wonderful when used appropriately and when well-matched to the purpose. Frank Sinatra was famous for insisting on using only one particular type of mic. I think it was a Neumann. Uh, now, Frank knew what he was doing. He didn't necessarily know an awful lot about all the details of how the studio worked, but he knew how it worked for him. He knew how his voice worked for him. And he had learned that good use of that microphone would allow to sort of hear inside his voice. Now, there's nothing wrong with a dynamic. A dynamic can do that. But when you get the right match of singer to condenser, you tend to get a little bit more of it. But this mindset that's appeared in the last 10 or so years that you can only do it with a condenser is total unmitigated BS. And as a mix engineer, I see, or I hear, um, impractical pairing and just plain poor usage of condensers. And it makes those vocals hard to mix because they are not pleasing. They don't sound good. The oversensitivity and of that microphone has become problematic, as in we start to hear an awful lot of stuff we don't want to hear in that singer or that speaker. Voice clicks, pops, um, nasty gravel, not good gravel, not sort of um, 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 Joe Cocker gravel, but just nasty tone from a poor set of pipes or poorly trained pipes or poorly prepared pipes, as in somebody who doesn't know how to sing, the condenser will merely exaggerate that because it gets it even more obvious, whereas a dynamic will tend to be far more broad in what it hears, therefore much easier to mix and get a nice result from. So condensers are great, but only if you know what you're doing with them, otherwise you are probably shooting yourself in the foot if you go into them, especially as a first microphone. As a general rule of thumb, your first microphone should be a dynamic. 
and if you buy well, it'll last you for a lifetime. There are other types of microphones you will encounter, ribbons. Ribbon microphones are incredibly sensitive. They're like a condenser, only more sensitive. In the right situation, in a studio setting, ribbon microphone can be great. Otherwise, avoid them like the plague, unless you want to be constantly having it repaired, because they are really, really delicate things. There are PZM mics, pressure zone mics. Uh, they are a slightly different approach. Rather than trying to listen to the air and potentially pick up reverb and what have you, they will be attached to a surface. So a PZM mic is often a square with a little book for its electronics on it. Kind of looks a little bit like a, a, a ray. Not a stingray, but a ray. And they will pick up the vibration off that surface. They are intriguing, but they're generally not used. I used to know somebody who used it for recording guitars and vocals and all kinds of things. Just hold it up like this. Odd usage, but generally ignore them. They are not appropriate for what you're doing. Binaural microphones are pretty rare. They're incredibly expensive. They're where you actually get a mannequin head and has microphones stuck in its ears in attempts to create realistic stereo, um, yeah, whatever. They're crazy expensive. Don't waste your time with them. And then, of course, you will encounter lapel, lavalier mics. They are commonly used various little technical functions to do what they do. They are not appropriate for singers or instruments in a general rule of thumb. If that's all you've got, use it. However, don't think that... Um, Lavalier or um, lapel or mics designed specially for video cameras like shotguns are well suited to studio recording. They're not. If that's all you've got, use them. Otherwise, don't buy them. The other technical thing we need to look at is that mics run on a pickup and rejection pattern. So the patterns define what they're listening to. A loudspeaker, as we said, tends to push air in front of it. It's pushing air behind itself as well, but most of the time it's in a box. And if that box is sealed, the speaker is only pushing air forward. Therefore, we tend to hear a loudspeaker better when we're standing in front of it. Some speakers are very access defined, as in you need to be on access, as in looking straight at them to hear them accurately. That's relatively rare. They tend to have what's called a wide dispersion these days. So anywhere in front of them. But naturally, you will find that if you've got a loudspeaker and you walk around the side of it, you don't hear it quite the same. You start to lose a little bit of detail. And then around the back, obviously, it gets more woolly. And you're losing a lot of detail, especially if that speaker was absolutely perfect in its box design and, and no sound comes out the back of that at all, as in that is completely physically inert. You could put your ear to the back of that speaker and be like you're listening to a brick. There would be nothing there, but that's incredibly hard to do and possibly not even meritorious in most situations. A microphone has similar kinds of patterns. So an omnidirectional mic will pick up everything everywhere. So it's picking up 360 degrees around the ball of that mic. That's not used that often. There are times and situations, but generally you don't want that. Some mics give you the ability to change patterns. Omni is generally the first thing you want to switch it away from. There is cardioid or carotoid, if you run into people like myself who were trained far enough ago, that that was the common reference. A carotoid mic, cardioid meaning heart-shaped. So they are designed that at the front of the mic, the bit that you're going to sing into, they will tend to be more sensitive and they will tend to reject from the sides and to a fair extent from the back. So cardioid, hypercardioid, uh, unidirectional are all variants on that shape where you try to have the microphone so that you hear from the front, don't hear from the sides and even reject what's coming in from the back of the microphone. Now you will commonly see people doing what's referred to as cupping the mic, where they're up there like... <laughs> and all kinds of... 
plosives coming up. Do not do this. The reason that the mics sound really bad, not to mention the plosives because you're too close, but the reason the mics sound bad is because you're wrecking the rejection pattern. They're designed to actually hear from the back. So you see the back end of this microphone up here. You've got the silver ring showing the front and then the back end. And that back end is trying to actually hear things so that it can say, let's not actually put this into the final signal. It's trying to reject that. So if you go blocking that back end, <laughs> like some kind of rapper, uh, then heavy metal guys are taking to do it. Lots of people are taking to do it. It's horrid. Uh, then not only will the mic sound poor, but it will struggle to reject room signal, room sound. And one of the great things, particularly with dynamic mics, is that they're not as sensitive. Therefore, they don't pick up the room as much. So be aware of your patterns, use your patterns with care, and don't hold or position the mic in such a way as to wreck the pattern. The other pattern that you will see is called figure eight. So the mic will pick up well on the front and equally well on the back and reject the sides. So that's for people who have one microphone that they are having a conversation backwards and forwards across. It's an old form of radio mic for interviews where they had one mic, would sit close to each other, and the mic would pick up the pair of them one from each side. We don't need to fuss about that much. Then we, once we've got a microphone, and we'll look at options later, then we've got to work out how to connect it to our system. Because remember, a microphone's about collecting sound from the air, transforming it into electricity that we can put into our recording studio, commonly these days, a door. Now, there are two main types of interface and two or three main types of plugs, but the main types of interface. One is that you are increasingly seeing USB mics. These are consumer grade and should be avoided like the pox that they are. They are poor. While the fitting is okay, it's not very robust. The USB fitting was never designed to be under any kind of stress, so they tend to break. Uh, they tend to also have some kind of inbuilt preamp because a microphone's input signal, like what it's getting from you speaking to it, even if you're quite loud, is a tiny, 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 tiny voltage, like tiny. Therefore, it needs to be amplified. And it needs to be amplified appropriately. If you just whack that into your Marshall stack and turn it up, it will never amplify properly. It'll just sound, well, it'll sound terrible. Uh, it'll sound more like Slash falling downstairs, then it will sound like Slash playing guitar or Slash singing. I don't know whether Slash sings much, but it will sound atrocious. So you need a mic preamp. Now, the problem with the USB things is that they use cut rate and commonly digital preamps. While digital amps can actually be quite good, the real key is that they use cut rate because it's consumer equipment and price is important at that point. People are going, what's the cheapest I can buy? And therefore, they are saying, what is the nastiest I can buy? Just avoid USB mics. If it's all you've got and you can't get anything better right now, use it, but understand that it's not the best you could have done. You need to be running an audio interface, and that is a box, generally a USB box, which will plug into USB 2 or USB 3 on your computer, and that should have interface 4, microphones. There are two main types of plugs for microphones. There's the one that looks like a guitar jack, so the big six and a half millimeter headphone jack type shape, but it's a cheaper connection. It's not the ideal, but they exist. And the other one is the XLR, which is a big, round, ugly thing. You can drive over those in a car and still use them. They are for stage work and they are tough. When you get to that point, don't go buying the cheapest cables you can. Buy decent quality cables. They don't need to be gold-plated or any kind of garbage like that. They just need to be sort of stage-ready kinds of things because they can last you a lifetime, essentially, if you buy properly. And you don't want signal loss across your cable. You don't want your cable to be longer than necessary. So like buying a 300-meter microphone cable isn't always the wisest thing if you're two meters away from your interface. Buy a two-meter cable. So you need an interface and buying an audio interface 
and a mic may seem a little bit of money, but chances are it's not as much as wasting money on buying a USB, which is a bit more expensive in the first place than it needs to be, especially for the quality of result that it's able to give you. In other words, it's garbage. Uh, pretty garbage. Often they're very pretty, selling them to podcasters or wannabe singers and what have you. And it's like, oh, look, it's blue and it's lovely. And it's like, yeah, but it's not very good. So spend the proper money in the first place. An audio interface will last you years. I currently have an Audient Evo 4, which is, I think, one of the cheapest interfaces in the market. Buy proper stuff, buy, you know, what we might loosely call pro-level gear, even though this is prosumer. Don't buy random things that you're not going to find in a proper musician's store. Um, in Australia, somewhere like Store DJ, if they carry it, it's probably okay. If it's from some kind of weird-ass place, especially on the internet, it's probably not okay, and you'll be wasting your money. So audio interface, plug your mic into that. Most audio interfaces come with at least a passable mic preamp, if not actually really rather good one. Equally, don't waste money on buying um, mic preamps or audio interfaces that claim these amazeballs, most amazing, bestest ever kinds of preamps that you're paying a whole pile of extra money for. Chances are it's not worth it. So something like this Audient Evo 4 will do your job just fine. That is the way you want to go. Remember, USB mics, only use them if you've got them. Don't spend any more money on them at all. They are just not a wise path. There are better ways to go. Now, we get to the point where normally I don't do this, but in this case, I am going to run over what sort of mics should you buy. Now, I am not, as I said earlier, going to tell you buy these mics. I'm just going to show you types of mics and mics that I have either physically worked with or know that I have worked with in mixing work, as in I know the client, because clients have a habit of wanting to tell me all the gear they've used. I really couldn't give a flying banana peel what gear you've used unless I ask and go, what's, what's, what's the story here for some reason? Like maybe that sounds terrible. Um, in which case... Then I might talk about gear, but people will tell me, and so I know that I have worked with some of these mics, also because I've done some competition work with one of these manufacturers. The cheapest mic that I have ever used, and you are listening to it right now, is, and these are Australian dollars, this is from Store DJ in Australia, uh, is the Behringer Ultra Voice XM8500 Dynamic Carotoid Vocal Mic. This thing is cheap as chips. It is peanut priced, but it massively outguns anything else that I have ever discovered anywhere near its price point. And I'm not the only person I've heard things on the on YouTube, like where people are comparing price point mics, and this is just like streets ahead of anything anywhere near its price point. So if you are on a budget and you're not in a position where you can or want to spend a lot of money on a mic, but you want something that's actually going to do the job, then the Behringer XM8500 is it. I don't know that there is anything else out there. I'm not saying don't try them. Try microphones, find what sounds good. But this is the closest thing to a good microphone that you will get, and it's definitely good enough for any kind of work that you need to do. That's in the dirt cheap category. There is then, this is that Shaw SM58 that you've been seeing in the picture all along. This is the cornerstone mic. It has a very close cousin called an SM57, primarily designed a little bit more for very high inputs. So SM57s are used on instruments and particularly loud instruments like kick drums. But if you end up with a 57 instead of a 58, you haven't hurt yourself in any way. They are both absolute cornerstone mics. So if you have more money than the $45 for the Behringer, then spend the $200 on the Shaw SM58. That is your cornerstone mic. You can use it for anything and it will last a lifetime. My um, little Behringer mic, I have had for at least 15 years, could be 20. Um, 
it shows no degradation whatsoever. The SM58 will last you a whole lifetime and you can record anything with it. Anything. Uh, if you think you need something better, then you are either contemplating your navel or in a serious enough situation that you need something and by that time you probably should know what you need. Therefore, if you find yourself with an SM58 and going to the internet, oh internet, tell me what should I buy to do better? A mix engineer is what you should buy. Not a microphone, but a mix engineer. All right, next sort of level, and I've never worked with one of these myself, but I have mixed quite a lot of songs, all the Jake Cropley record, and therefore also the um, Naked Head record, all the vocals were recorded with uh, Jake's Road. The, um, I'm pretty sure it was this or very, very similar. Uh, it's a condenser, so it's physically a lot more sensitive. You see that it comes with this cage to hang in. You can hold them by hand, but you just need to be a lot more careful with them. The Rode is a fine, cheap mic. Obviously, we're spending a little bit more, but I know from results that so long as you basically know what you're doing with it, you will get very, very workable results from this thing. That's a very common recommendation. Past that, you're kind of getting into your own territory. There are a lot of mics that are famous. Uh, and are they bad mics? I'm absolutely not going to say so because, you know, Neumanns and what have you are great mics, apparently. But I've never worked with one to my knowledge. I may have worked with them, but I just can't be bothered listening when people want to tell me all about what gear they've got, as I said. It's irrelevant. But LeWitt are making some rather nice microphones. They're cheap microphones, I have no idea, I've never heard any of them. But I have done mixes that I know have been 100% Lewitt because they have come from Lewitt. They say, here, have these things, mix them. Uh, and I like the sounds of each of those. I've done three or four of them and they have all sounded really nice. I think they're largely using this microphone or something similar. Not stupid expensive, uh, but not dirt cheap. Uh, Lewitt's are probably worth a look. Uh, they're practical. They're designed to be practical far more than pretty. And this is what you want in a mic. It's there to do a job. If its only job is to look pretty, buy a USB mic, don't plug it in. Buy a picture of a microphone, stick it on your wall. You're not there for the right reasons. Mics are there to do a job. Uh, past this, well, you really need to know what you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, or you're just asking the internet to tell you what to do, oh, forum, I've, I'm not happy with my vocal mic. I need a new vocal mic. I just encountered one of these. Had to listen to the song. Eventually, I, I, I tracked down some of the work. The problem was not the microphone. The problem was maybe the recording. I don't know. I don't think it was a bad recording. The problem was the mixing. They didn't know how to mix, but rather than acknowledging they didn't know how to mix and therefore getting a mix engineer, they were going to waste a whole pile of money on a microphone they did not need, which would not solve their problem. So that's the kind of range or suggestion of microphones, running through them again. So Lewitt has some very interesting product. I know, I think it's this one from work that I have mixed and it's very nice, but don't go here until you're really in a position to know exactly why you're buying this. Not to be like, oh, so I'm more pro than the other people who haven't bought this mic. That's not pro, that's stupid. The Rode is a good mic with a good reputation, and I have mixed a lot of work that have been recorded with these, and it's all fine. So long as it's used reasonably well, it is a fine, practical mic, but it is not where you should be starting. If you have the budget, start with a Shure SM58. It will last you a lifetime. It will be part of your cabinet or box of microphones and will always be useful and always able to deliver a good result as long as you've set it up. It's practical, it's tough, you can drive over these things. If you really don't have a budget, then the Behringer XM8500 is stupid cheap and amazingly good for its stupid price. I'm using it right now and have done for, as I said, probably 15, 20 years, both vocal 
for this kind of stuff, and I've done quite a lot of songs with it as well for clients. It is as good as you want to be with it. So as long as you've got a decent singer and you've got someone who knows how to mix, that mic will do you absolutely stellar service. And as I said, 15, 20 years of mine, there's no sign of damage on it whatsoever. I'm kind to my mic, uh, but it is tough enough, far tougher and far better quality than you would expect. In terms of your interface, as I suggested before, I'm running this um, Behringer mic with um, an Evo 4, an Audient Evo 4. I'll pop up a picture of those. By the time you spend that money somewhere else, you've probably not got a combination that is as good. That will see you work well, so long as you're kind to your gear for a very, very long time. You will only need to upgrade that kind of thing if you've got a genuine reason. Again, thinking, ah, oh, but I don't like the results I'm getting, I'll ask the internet what I should get is not a genuine reason. It's a sure sign that you need to hire a mix engineer. If there are problems with your recording, if you hire a proper mix engineer and you allow them to be honest, they'll tell you. Which gets us to how we should use our mic. As I've said, we should never hold our mic like this. <laughs> Sticking the mic down your throat is a bad plan. It means you're using it wrong. Holding the mic so that you're cupping the ball like in holding the back end of the ball is wrong. If you look at old 70s shows, people would be holding the microphone like this, and when they start to sing loud, they would do this. This is actually good mic technique. They didn't have such heavy amount of compressors back then, but that is good mic technique. You hear that there's a tremendous amount of detail in the singer, the singing, um, even though technically the quality was poorer, uh, and you're not hearing big plosives or nastiness, as in scratchiness or anything like that. So hold the mic in a way that you're not impacting on its ability to connect signal and reject signal. The best investment, the single best investment that you will get once you have an appropriate microphone is a microphone stand. Nothing fancy, just one of those sticks, maybe with a right angle that can put the microphone close to you. But they're not necessarily 100% needed. If you are working with a singer who is holding the mic, they merely have to learn to hold the mic still, which they're going to need to learn to if they're going to go on stage, and they need to learn not to keep handling it. I don't know whether that'll pick up. I don't think it is very well because it's relatively dead, but especially poor quality mics will get a lot of handling noises, like creepy sort of noise. You don't want that. A mic stand will allow you to position it in a particular place, and that's it. People start touching your mic, punch them. Simple as that. Now, in terms of positioning, we do not want to be close. I start getting in close like this. I'm speaking less loudly, but it sounds creepy. You don't want to do this. Give it air to breathe. Because when you're speaking to somebody, unless it's, well, that's your business, they're not got their mouth here. When you're in a nightclub and they've got their mouth here, it's unpleasant, especially if you're like me and a little autistic and you just, ooh, get off me. You need air. Air is part of recording. A lot of people want to get rid of air, but they are, well, at best amateurs. Air is part of the recording and that allows the sound to breathe. If you're after more of a creepy sound or you want to increase the size of the... Um, manliness of a person, then you can use a proximity effect to get them closer, but then you increase your chances of plosives, which is where we spit on the mic. That won't have sounded nice, but I want to show you and make it very clear, that's what a plosive is. So if your mic is sounding muddy, chances are it's being held, it can't breathe, and that it's not got enough air between it. I'm showing here in the picture, four to six inches, 10 to 15 centimeters. I've got sort of this distance. Obviously that's hard to say, but it's most of my torso away from this microphone. It does mean that the gain, the drive, is up a little higher, but I'm not pulling in an undue amount of room noise. Yes, if the neighbours start having a fight outside, you will be aware of it, but it's not like 
we need to go and use noise reducers or anything creepy and nasty to mess up the signal. So just a mic stand, get your positioning so that the voice breathes nicely. If you are going closer, you will see that the microphone here is up a little. You'll see people using microphones here and then wondering why they get a kind of a sound because you're losing all the clarity. The clarity tends to actually come from the top lip. So putting it a little forward and a little up, mine's a little down, but it's good enough. Uh, if you're going closer, go a little above because the sound coming up here is a little brighter. It's a little bit more detailed. So where the lips are actually conforming the sound, you will get a little bit more of that there. And so you will get a sweeter sound, generally speaking. But you've got to check. Not everybody is going to have exactly the same physical makeup. You might find someone who sings out the side of their eyes like this. Yay, Billy Idol. In which case, you may well need to move the mic to adjust for them. This is your job. If you're not doing that, if you're just saying that's exactly... <laughs> And then, then you need to hire either a mix or a recording engineer. Positioning. Okay, so you need a stand. There is a big obsession recently with screens, these strange wraparound things or, or um, pretend vocal booths and all this kind of stuff. They are unmitigated BS. If your room is reasonably quiet, that's all you need. That and a dynamic carotoid mic is what you need. If you insist on using a high-gained um, Omni condenser, that's your problem. It really is, because you're going to have problems mixing it. It's not the fault of the mic, it's the fault of mismatching your situation. Using a set of shields is merely going to warp the room. It's still going to hear the rest of the room. Remember, air is everywhere. If I add some of my own unique special Benedict air to this room, the whole room is going to take pleasure from that. So the idea that we can just wrap a little shield and it's going to change part of the room, no, it's going to make the room weird. The same with if we get the idea that we're going to create some kind of weird vocal booth, put blankies over our head or hang dunas. I see these things all the time in amateur groups. Do not do them at all because you'll end up with a weird sounding room. And once you've got weird sound on tape, you can't get rid of it. All you can do is make it worse. Remember when we're mixing, we're emphasizing whatever is there. So if you've got a poor singer who sings out of tune, it doesn't matter how much we auto-tune them, mellow tune them, whatever, they'll always sound out of tune because their formants are wrong. Yes, in theory, you can get in there with a formant plug-in, and but it'll always sound weird. It'll sound modified. They will sound wrong. So send your singer away and tell them, hey, learn to sing more naturally. Stop trying to pretend to be a singer and simply tell us the story. And then you will find, thank you, and then you will find that you get a more workable result, even if they aren't perfectly in tune. You don't need to waste your time making your thing sound weird with mellow tune, you've got something that's good. If your mic positioning is poor, you've got something that's broken. If you're trying to make your room weird, by trying to solve your room, your room does not need solving. If you're going to record in, in a public bathroom, the situation probably needs solving, unless that's deliberate. If that's part of the performance, great, go for it. Take photos, put them on the record cover. But if you're recording in a normal room, it should be like this, which is pretty quiet. In which case, good enough. So don't go down that road of um, buying shields and what have you. Same to a fair extent goes with those little pop shields you saw in the picture of the road. Uh, it comes with this pop shield. I won't say don't use them, but all you're doing is reducing the sensitivity of the mic because you're putting the voice through the sock before it gets to the mic. <laughs> it probably means that you either need to move the person off axis, so in other words, the mic, you have them sing a little like this, if they are, if you're insisting on having them close and they're very <laughs> and can't learn to solve that, 
put them off axis. So when they are, pff, the air blows past the microphone rather pff, onto it. So don't go out of your way with these things. If you're getting too much clicks and plops and maybe move back. It's all you've got to do. So avoid any of that kind of stuff because you're just going to create a lot of problems. I'm also seeing a bit of a thing. Now, hopefully this disappears fairly quickly, but it can be cool, but it's largely just a technical overkill, a sign that people don't really focus on the song. They focus on thinking that if they do all kinds of cool, clever producery stuff, that their song will be good. No, your song will be pathetic. And all we'll hear is clever producery stuff, and your song will be even more pathetic because it's trying to be buried under this layers of producery stuff. So, multi-miking and stereo miking. There are situations in which these things are good and very necessary. But bearing in mind who this is pitched to, if you suddenly think you need more than one microphone to record something, like me, if I think that I need 47 microphones, either I'm a <laughs> dictator uh, or there is some other thing going on. The agenda is wrong. You don't need multi-microphones to record a single singer. You absolutely don't. Yes, you could, if you had many microphones, record two of them, but you need to record them to two completely discrete tracks and then decide which you want. Uh, and also, if you are going to run them literally as one, you've also got to make sure that they are what's called in phase. So if one of those microphones has a slightly longer cable, it could be slightly delayed. If one of those microphones is just physically slower or is wired the other way around, then you could find that you're actually making your signal sound strange because you're gutting it, you're phasing it. There is no practical reason, generally speaking, at this level of the business to be running more than one mic at a time. If you're miking instruments, which I have not talked about because I just don't do it, I know the theory broadly, but I've never done it, I've never wanted to do it, then you might have situation in which case you want to use a couple, but don't use two mics until you know how to get a great recording with one. If you can't get a great recording with one mic, using two mics or four mics or 14,000 mics will not get you a better recording. It'll probably just sound worse. If you can't get a good recording, then you need to talk to a mix engineer or a recording engineer. Not somebody who goes, oh, oh, well, I'm so special at this because I've got lots of microphones and I've given myself a studio name. No, you need to find somebody who really does this for a living. Yes. Hello, David Bowie. Who records your stuff? Oh, right. Have you got his phone number? Oh, thank you. That's who you want to talk to. All right. So... Once you've got your, the mic that suits what you need, remember there's no right or wrong mic. And when you are at home recording probably yourself, then the most right mic is probably the Behringer 8500, the XM8500, or the Shure SM58, depending upon your budget. The Shure SM58 is the better of the two mics, but it is a higher price. They are your best practical mics for your situation because they are designed to reject a fair amount of the room um, as well as deliver a pretty natural tone. That's all you need. Get a mic stand so that it's not rolling around. If you can't or don't want to get a mic stand, and sometimes they are impractical, like a mic stand is very impractical for me where I am. I've actually got, uh, well, it's actually an empty box. It's a box for my Evo um, audio interface and a couple of foam pads. You know, the peanuts for washing a car, the little foam peanuts, a couple of those. So it helps isolate from the, the banging that we get here. You still hear the keys because this keyboard's hideously noisy, but it isolates a certain amount of the, the bed bang. Uh, and then there's actually a little hand towel around it just to help make sure that it doesn't roll away. There is nothing wrong with doing this kind of stuff. If you are jury rigging something like that, get it so that it's the same every time. Otherwise, if it's different every time, you will have a different result every time. It'll sound different every time. Like if I move over here, I no longer sound the same. If I move over here, I no longer sound the same. If I move here, so same, 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 same. 
Also, if you're jury rigging, uh, the cardboard box is well underneath the foam pads. Simply because if I put this microphone boop, 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 um, on a cardboard box or a wooden box, then it will actually pick up the vibration of that. That will become a sound box and bleed into the microphone. That really covers everything. A microphone is a personal choice. It is not a crowdsource opinion. Your very basics are to get a decent quality dynamic. If you have no money, the Behringer will do a fine job. If you have the money, the Shaw SM58, or if for some bizarre reason they're not around, a 57 will do the job. And they will last a lifetime if you are not stupid and unkind to them. Uh, only buy fancier condenser mics when you're at a point where you really know what that means. And if you are asking the internet, what should I buy, you don't know what you need. Test mics. Some mics will sound great with you, and some mics will not sound great with you. But the um, two that I'm saying are great, the Behringer and the Shaw mics, they will sound fine with anybody. It's only, you know, a couple of percent. And yes, if you're Frank Sinatra, you can, uh, be, you can afford to obsess about a fraction of a percent of something or other. But if you are the kind of audience we're primarily aimed at, somebody who's got a door in their bedroom and trying to put things together. Worrying about the tiny percent is is a little like, um, well, you're looking at the detail, ignoring the object. The old expression of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. You have lost track of the thing of value and you're focusing on everything else. Make sure that you choose your gear practically and carefully and for practical and careful reasons. Don't go obsessing about tiny details because if you're obsessing about tiny details, it tells me that you need a mix engineer who probably can help you with the basics of getting your recordings right or failing that, you need to find somebody who really knows how to record, which is not some person on the internet who has a recording studio but no work to show or their work is truly terrible, in which case, why would you listen to them? I have shown specific products. That doesn't mean that they are right or great for you to buy or suited to you, but you probably won't go wrong with them if you know what you're doing. Uh, whether they're going to have links down below, I really don't know. I have used an Australian website, a store DJ, and therefore Australian pricing, so it's not necessarily going to reflect the part of the world in which you live. Buy locally where you can. Support local. There's no point buying from Australia because the Australian dollar is better or something. You've got to ship it, and then you've got to deal with it if there is an issue. These kinds of mics, especially the Behringer and the Shaw, highly unlikely to have issues, but if they do, you've got something local and practical and you've supported a local business who are far more likely to support you if you have made friends with them. If you have any questions broadly, not about what mic you should buy, I've already answered that. If you have any broad questions about the subject, hit subscribe, type it on in below. Once I become aware of it, I will give you a broad answer. Please don't ask me to mix your stuff, or please do ask me to mix your stuff, because that's what I do for a living. But don't ask me to mix your stuff by proxy. If you think that your mic isn't working for you, post publicly something that we can hear clearly, like a recording, uh, and I'll give you an impression as to what I think. Uh, and then you need to leave that there for other people to learn from, because they're probably needing to ask the very same question as you. Why does my voice sound scratchy? Those sorts of things. That's it. Go out there, practice, have fun.